to the President. Mr. President, I begin by congratulating you for being elected to your new post. And I know that after such a difficult campaign, you will continue the excellent work done by your colleague Martin Schulz, who increased the profile and the relevance of this institution as you have um, managed to do in your other rules. You will do your utmost during this very um, a difficult period for our Europe and I assure you that the Maltese Presidency will be a fair um, a partner and will work assiduously to achieve the um, results we seek. So congratulations to you and the other candidates. Mr. President, I must say that this is an emotional moment for me. The last time that I entered into this plenary session nine years ago was as a member of this chamber and at those times with Louis Gregg, who today is my Deputy Prime Minister. Perhaps we could check that. Okay. So, President, Mr. Madam, Mr. President, I must say this is an emotional moment for me. The last time that I entered this chamber nine years ago was as a member of this European Parliament, and in those times with Louis Gregg, who is my Deputy Prime Minister, and others, we were the first group of European parliamentarians who were coming from countries who were called at that time the new member states. There was much excitement and optimism in the air in this institution as well as throughout Europe. Our concern was on growth of the economy, how we may deliver the Agenda 2020 in a timely manner, how we may protect our consumers more, how we may move Europe forward. And a few, however, could anticipate the international financial crisis which would sacrifice so many jobs. No one was going to expect that strong banks would have to be saved by the money of taxpayers and few would expect that we would have talks so that member states would be saved from uh, failure. And hardly anybody thought that we would start talks so that one of us would leave. There were many smiles when we would be very few who would talk about the crisis of immigration, which in those times was still esteemed to be that of a Mediterranean problem and not a European problem. In those times, of course, we had two minutes, sometimes five, to talk. Today I have a few more minutes and I am going to try to use this privilege in the best possible manner. I know that many of you have read the program of the Maltese Presidency and intentionally and with our friends, the Dutch and Slovaks, is very focused. For the six months to come, we have uh, chosen to focus on six sectors, immigration, the single market, security, social inclusion, uh, the, the Europe's neighborhood and the maritime sector. And I am going to choose, instead of saying a few sentences on each sector, I'm going to focus on a few of them and beyond them. And I am going to try to draw some lessons and some parallels in how uh, Malta and the world has changed in the last 10 years and the air we had breathed last time and today in this plenary and within the European institutions and above all where things are really important within the homes of our families within Europe and throughout Europe and obviously afterwards I will be ready to answer questions on all these uh, issues. Migration. We know for a fact that there is a need for a holistic policy which has gone amiss for many years and that only recently has been recognized as a priority. I must say that the Commission has shown exceptional leadership in this, as has Parliament. And I have to admit that the stuttering is coming from the institution I represent here today. I will not waste your time in repeating cliches that have been going the rounds for so long on the need of using all our policies, including development aid and a long-term approach. 
We all know that, and we all agree with that. Finally, also thanks to decisions taken during the Valletta Summit a little over a year ago, which have given new impetus to the external dimension and led to the negotiation of a number of contact compacts which are the basis for such a long-term approach. But the issue is much more pressing, and time is not on our side. You know very well Malta's position on this issue. We have been harping for more than a decade that the migration situation in the Mediterranean is unsustainable. We are amongst the first to sow the seeds, even within this parliament, on the need for responsibility sh sharing and also the sharing of the burden of managing the flows that cannot fall exclusively on the shoulders of frontline member states. Yet, we were left almost alone for many years trying to overcome a crisis which was not our making. The only solution we were given, and only at times, was some more money. But that is not a solution. I confess that when last year we came to take sides in Council on the distribution mechanism proposed by the Commission, there were quite some voices back at home that urged me to stand against the relocation of migrants. They would say nobody helped us when we needed it. We took our fair share over the years. Now let us mind our own business. I assure you that it would have been a stand which would have been very popular and would have had a popular backing within the silent majority. Instead, we opted to do just the opposite because we know that this is an issue of principles and credibility. Solidarity is not an a la carte option that we use when, you, when, when we need it and turn a blind eye to when others need it. Solidarity is an essential European value at the very core of what the founding mothers Solidarity is an essential European value at the very core of what the founding mothers and fathers envisaged 60 years ago in Rome. And so, the smallest member state, which over the years, bar last, the last few, has suffered firsthand the brunt of the human plight of migration with no or little help signed up to take asylum seekers from other member states which are facing a crisis. To me, that is more than enough to assert that our European and human values are indisputable. I was sorry to see a minority of member states resist the system. During these six months, we can choose to dig our heels further and antagonize each other even more? Or, on the other hand, we can try to understand any genuine concerns and misgivings that these member states, and indeed our people in our own member states, have about the whole way in which Europe is handling the migration issue. We opted for a two-pronged approach, which focuses on the effective management of our borders while concurrently working to achieve progress on the fairer location of responsibility and, to be very clear, the fair allocation of burden, since we are now used to calling it so. The proper management of our land and, more programmatically, our sea borders is part and parcel of our approach towards the revision of the Dublin Regulation which needs to be an ambitious and workable solution. The last major crisis that we had caught Europe unprepared. Also because the situation was rendered even more critical by our own inadequate and dated European systems and procedures. In fact, these flaws were exposed 
in the un tas tika izjusts visā pilnībā kas radīja dažādas pieejas tātad vai nu būvēt sienu vai nē un beigu beigās vienīgais veids kā apturēt šo straumi bija vienoties ar Turciju mēs zinām ka tā nav perfekta vienošanās un ka tas nav ilgtermiņa risinājums taču mums jāsaprot ka tas tomēr kaut ko ir mainīts. Eiropa nevar nonākt vēlreiz šādā juceklī. Nākošajās pavasarī droši vien parādīsies atkal jaunas migrantu straumnes droši vien ar centrālu vidus jūras reģionu. Un jāsaka, ka to sastāvs, to cilvēku sastāvs, kas gatavojas riskēt ar savu dzīvību pārceļojot, ir ļoti atšķirīgs no sīriešiem, kas brauca pār Egejas jūru. Mēs zinām, ka valstis šajā reģionā ir ļoti atšķirīgas no Turcijas. Tomēr es uzskatu, ka nav nekādu šaubu, ka ja Turcijas vienošanās netiek īstenota arī vidus jūras reģionā, tad būs milzīga krīze. Es neredzu nekādu veidu, kā kāda dalība valsti pati spēja absorbēt šos cilvēkus vai apturēt šo straumi. Tāpēc pamat principi be seriously tested unless we act now. Let me be also very clear in what I mean by the replication of the essence of the Turkey deal. I mean, most importantly, breaking. Tas būtu kriminālo bandu biznesa modeļa sagrauši. Business. I do believe that a strong political message is necessary at this point and i say that if we manage to get such an agreement we should then as a european union organize humanitarian safe passages and corridors that would get recognized asylum seekers to europe safely One final point on migration. I have no doubt that unless we are ready to take such bold moves, we would be made to take even bolder ones in the months to come. And these decisions would be led by people who do not have the progress of the European project at heart. This is a matter which we intend tackling directly during the meeting of the heads of state and government in Malta next month. I said I will not go into each and every priority of the presidency, but I cannot make this address without mentioning specifically the priority of security. The European Union is meant to deliver an area of freedom, security and justice for its citizens. Our citizens need to feel safe and protected wherever they are within Europe. In recent times, we have seen a direct threat to that security. We have learned at our own cost that the security of one member state is the security of another. If we are not together, we are extremely vulnerable. Strengthening our resilience to protect our way of life is a common responsibility and therefore taking cooperation in this area to a different level is not an option. Member states and institutions need to work relentlessly to deliver a safe Europe for the citizens. In recent months a lot has been done but a lot more needs to be done and our efforts need to increase because time is really of the essence. The Maltese presidency will work hand in hand with you as Parliament to address this common challenge with determination. 
Allow me now to take some time to discuss Brexit. It is quite a historic irony for a country that has been a British colony for two centuries and which currently also presides the Commonwealth to hold the presidency of the Council of the European Union at the time of the triggering of the process by means of which the United Kingdom will, unfortunately, cease to be a member of the European Union which it supported us to join. Given our historical ties and the great and mostly positive influence that the British systems had on our own from the basis of our educational and administrative systems to English, which is one of our two official languages, from the George Cross for the bravery shown by our forefathers during the Second World War, which we proudly display on our flag, to the side of the road on which we drive, this is not a happy event for us. We want a fair deal for the United Kingdom, but that deal necessarily needs to be inferior to membership. This should not come as a surprise to anyone. Indeed, thinking it can be otherwise would indicate a detachment from reality. Yesterday's statement by my colleague and friend Prime Minister May helps clarify the priorities of the British government during the impending negotiations. Our understanding is that Prime Minister May is prioritizing curbs to freedom of movement of people over membership of the single market and the customs union. She added that she does not want for the United Kingdom to replicate something that exists, but the creation of something new. I would like to confirm to this House today that at this point there is unequivocal unity within Council. This stand does not arise from antagonism, but from belief in the core principles of the European project. As stated by the 27 heads of states and government after the Brexit referendum results, which we respect as a sovereign decision, the freedom of movement of persons, goods, services and capital cannot be decoupled. Put it simply, the four freedoms are indivisible. Indeed, the fact that the British Prime Minister declared that she will take her country out of the single market because of the political choice to limit freedom of movement of persons confirms the position of the EU 27, that the four freedoms are one package. That in itself is a somewhat positive development. This is not to say that we should allow these principles to be abused or undermined. Freedom of movement of persons is aimed at allowing people to move freely across the member states to work and establish themselves and their families freely. It was never meant to encourage people to shop around member states to see who offers the best social benefits. This is why we look forward to the Commission proposals in this area. Once there is a notification, a clear and clean cut from current arrangements and afterwards negotiated an unrelated and new free trade agreement ushered in by possible transitional agreements where European rules and institutions cannot be compromised will be an arduous task, as our recent experiences in trade agreements suggest. There should never be an underestimation of this task, as there should never be an underestimation of our colleagues on the other side of the table. I would like to report to you how Council intends to go about the mechanics of Brexit. 
first of all, we will keep to the maxim that there will be absolutely no negotiations without the official notification. Once the notification is made, depending also on the contents of such a notification, consultations will start amongst member states with the intention of convening an extraordinary European Council meeting within a short period of time, possibly four to five weeks from notification with the aim of establishing the guidelines that will serve as a mandate to the Commission to negotiate. I want also to take this opportunity to say that I am very impressed with the thorough preparations that Michel Barnier and his team are making. The Commission will be asked to refer back to Council as appropriate. The General Affairs Council will be tasked, tasked with the preparation of the Council's work. This leads me to the role of Parliament in all this. As already publicly stated, I advocate that Parliament should be involved as much as possible in this process. <clears throat> Having been part of this institution myself, I am aware of the organic dynamics that are within. I am of the opinion that not involving Parliament is not the best choice, it comes at its own risk, and it would also lead to even the fairest of deals risking to be scuttled. While saying this, I do appeal to all institutions to adopt a consistent approach that is aimed at safeguarding the European project and not at punishing any particular country. Before closing, I would like to pinpoint to a further element which is present in the narrative and the program of the Maltese Presidency, the social factor. I believe that the social aspect of this 60-year-old project is the essence of our European Union. It is it is, it is an ethos that no other group of nations can say is theirs. It is a characteristic that no trade deal can ever aspire to replicate. Indeed, social Europe is the X factor of the European Union. You either have it or you don't. This is why we want these six months to lead the drive towards a strengthening of this ideal, which can go a long way in contributing towards the real questions that families across our continent are asking and the, experiencing and the experiences that they go through each and every day of their life. Social Europe should not be treated as a concept belonging to the 90s, but rather as the unique European essence the real scope behind projects such as the single market and the euro. The fact that we have not pursued this goal actively over the past few years may provide an explanation to the current mood in many of our member states. So we are proud to put Social Europe back on the agenda in sync with the Commission's recent work. I strongly believe that matching this dimension with policies, with policies conducive to economic growth and more and better jobs can help provide a guiding light not only to our people but also to the global community that is looking desperately for progressive leadership. Sur President, Embosta. Mr. President, I would have wished to talk about many other issues, and I hope to have the opportunity to talk about them as, rep as a reply to, your, to the interventions of colleagues. Amongst other issues, I will talk of the single market, taxation, interinstitutional dynamics, environment and climate, maritime sector, and the Bratislava Roadmap, the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, and above all, as I have already said, the social aspect. Europe means different things for different people. 
what to some may be more convergence to others may mean excessive control. What may be deemed to be subsidiarity by some could be thought of as an absence of Europeanism by others. However, undoubtedly, with all its defects, the European project of these last 60 years of a united Europe has brought about the best period in this continent's millennia story. This period brought the most prosperity and progress. This is why our theme is reunion. As the 60-year-old Europe, in its 60th year, Europe must not think of retiring, but of advancing. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. And I now give the floor to Jean-Claude Juncker, the President of the Commission. Monsieur le Président, Madame. President, ladies and gentlemen, members of the European Parliament, first of all, President, I'd like to congratulate you for having been elected President of this Assembly. I've known you for decades. I know that you're a convinced European, and I am sure that you will exercise your new function with your usual elegance and savoir-faire. I would also like to pay homage to Martin Schulz, not for the first time, and it won't be for the last time either. He was great president of this, Euro this European Parliament, and he's a great European, and Europe owes him a lot. I come from the smallest founding country of the European Union, and I'm very happy that Malta the smallest country in the European Union is taking the reins of the presidency of for the first time. Whenever I'm there, whenever in Malta, I say that the day that Malta became a member of the European Union was a very great day for me, because that day Luxembourg was no longer the smallest country in the European Union, so I was very much in favor of Malta joining. I'm very happy to see Malta taking the presidency of the Council of Ministers, because I know that the European commitment that, that Malta shows is in no way proportional to the size. Frequently, the smallest countries have the greatest presidencies because they're not trying to defend their own interests, but rather they have a great deal of ambition for Europe. And ambition is something we need more than ever in, a, in order to get our economies off the ground and uh, to face up to terrorist threat, and also to find a good way of reacting to the UK's decision to leave the EU and to prepare for a relationship with Donald Trump in the United States. I welcome what the Prime Minister of the UK said yesterday. I said yesterday a speech alone cannot trigger negotiations. Once the UK has activated Article 50, the negotiations will start, start, and they should be concluded within two years, according to the treaty, and the, the negotiations are going to be of great significance to that country, but also to the 27 member states. And I will do everything to make sure that the negotiations will be according to the rules and will yield good results. Most of our citizens and you and the Commission would have liked Europe to react more 
rapidly and with more greater solidarity to the events of 2016. Quite often, we end up uh, going down the route of the extremists when we defend our own interests because they make Europe responsible for all ills. I'd like to say straight away that, that they're wrong and they fool those people who think that if you close in on yourself and close your doors to migrants, that is the way to solve all problems. We need to show those people who think that this is the time to deconstruct Europe, to let it fall apart. We have to show them that they're wrong. Uh, on their own, no country will be able to organize the economy, fight unemployment, welcome in uh, migrants and fight terrorism. The Maltese presidency can count on the support of the European Commission so that we can stand together and so that we can celebrate the anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. So we're not just looking back, but that we're also looking forward and so that we have a clear vision for the future so we can re-found Europe, if you will, and so that we can stand united and strengthened to face all the challenges. Malta is a bridge between Europe and Africa, and we can trust Malta to take account of the ideas of the founders to go beyond national interests and to find that the solidarity which will enable us to be more effective in our efforts to stabilize our economies in Europe. More than once, over the last years, I've been sorry to see that solidarity was not always forthcoming. And I deplore the fact that for the first time in the history of Europe, some countries have not applied the decisions taken in an area as sensitive as asylum, although significant progress has been made in other places. We need to set up a permanent European system for managing migration in a credible and long-term fashion. The Commission has suggested reforming the rules of Dublin to set up a fair and clear system to help countries which have massive inflows of migrants but also, and also to change the European Asylum Support Office into a European uh, institute. I'd like to launch an appeal to everybody, and particularly to the Parliament and to the Council, to conclude the reform of Dublin under Maltese presidency, because time is pressing. And I'd also like the new Agency for Asylum to become operational as quickly as we were able to come up with the European Corps of uh, Coast Guards and Border Guards. This is a matter of the honor of Europe. Europe must uh, protect its borders while at the same time having a asylum policy which is uh, marked by solidarity. And we want to get rid of this idea that there's a dangerous amalgam of terrorism uh, of, and migrants. Ladies and gentlemen, of course people are worried about their security. We need to continue the fight against terrorism, particularly after the cowardly attacks in uh, Paris, Brussels, and in Germany. So we need to be able to monitor our borders. We need to know when terrorists are crossing our borders, and that means that systematically we have to check the movements of all borders, all people who cross our borders without a visa. I hope that our proposal on this will become reality by the end of the Maltese presidency. The other priority of, of our citizens is economic growth and jobs. 
here again we need to come up with real results and we need to do it quickly. We do that by doing away with barriers and thus creating new jobs and releasing our few, our full economic um, ability. The Maltese Presidency supports us in this, in uh, extending the digital single market. We're also opening up the access to capital markets for SMEs, so we open up additional sources of financing which are not just dependent on the banking sector. We also have to continue the offensive we've started and we have to make sure that this is to the benefit of as many SMEs as possible because they'd be creating the jobs of tomorrow. So I appeal that to you, let us make sure that the investment plan is adopted by the end of the Maltese Presidency. I'm very happy that the Maltese Presidency, as well as having a uh, priority which is econ economic, is also looking at social affairs. This is very important. As far as I'm concerned, the social dimension is essential for balance and for credibility for our European project. Our social policy must therefore be given the space it deserves, particularly by coming up with a European basis for social fairness. It's just a matter of containing and continuing and defending our European model so that we have a system and a market economy which protects everybody, particularly the weakest. We have to make we have to ensure that we don't leave the weakest by the roadside as we progress. When Malta joined the European Union, it opened the European Union to the high seas. And now, for the first time, Malta is taking the presidency of the European Council at a very important time when we have to decide whether we are going to continue or whether we are going to close in on ourselves. We need to look back to the founding fathers and we need to steer a steady course. I know that Malta will be able to keep the rudder steady. I'll appeal to everybody to do this. I'd like to say that I'd like to see 2017 to be the country at the year where we look forward and so that citizens, otherwise citizens, and particularly the young, will turn their backs on Europe. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Président. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you for your words to me and also for your commitment on behalf of my uh, citizens who were victims of the earthquake. Thank you very much. And also thank you for the European Union's uh, commitment to uh, working uh, for this. There's been another strong earthquake in the same area, 5.7, and it seems that there have been no deaths or uh, injuries. The civil protection authorities are saying they don't think there have been any deaths or injuries. So uh, this is already good news. But it's a, a very complicated situation. Moving on now to the debate. The floor is with the representatives of the political groups. And so on behalf of the EPP, we have Mr. Weber. President Antonio, Commission President, President in Office of, of Council, uh, Prime Minister, welcome. and. Uh, especially as you're a former member of the European Parliament, welcome back. We've had a fundamental debate in the European Parliament. You've got politicians on the right who say that the nations will lose influence if we build Europe. 
nations will become superfluous or be disbanded. And I think today's start to the Maltese presidency symbolizes the opposite. A small country like Malta, through its membership of the European Union, is stronger and has more clout and can assert its interests at the European level. That's why we welcome your presidency as a, a strong political signal. The priorities are right, ladies and gentlemen. Migration, first of all. Previously, we said that we wanted altogether to ensure that the deaths in the Mediterranean last year were brought to an end, that it happened no more. Concrete steps were needed. My request always as an MEP at the presentation of a new uh, Presidency of Council is make sure that what's already been agreed, 1.8 billion was agreed for the Africa Fund in Valletta, and 80 million euros only have been paid in by member states. 4% of the funds have been paid in. It's a tragedy. So many promises and so little delivery by the member states. So please look after that. We have to end the deadlock on solidarity in Europe, the right balance between helping and on the other hand, fighting illegal immigration. We want to fight terror together. You mentioned that. That needs more delivery, more implementation. And obviously, after every attack in Paris, Brussels or Berlin, the home ministers meet and say that there's no progress on data exchange. We have to do uh, something in Parliament to look at that, perhaps a committee of inquiry to investigate the background to that. We need to draw a line under citizens not being protected because of a lack of data exchange. This is what uh, citizens are calling for, more Europe, more security. Fairness and justice is the next buzzword on the continent. The fact that many uh, big companies uh, don't pay tax, whereas small businesses have to pay hand over fist. Also, Panama, the tax havens uh, that we discussed briefly today, I think that is something that needs examination our society is calling for justice. And then, last but not least, next week we are going to be looking at more jobs and voting for measures there. If we want to give a future to the young people of this continent, especially in the south, we need a modern trade policy. We're going to be putting CETA to the vote, and I'm grateful that a socialist government, a government of the left in Malta, is standing up loud and clear for CETA. We need to progress. Another topic, a technical one that I want to touch on, important for us as parliamentarians, preparations for the 2019 European elections. We've got a European electoral law and finally we need to see some movement in the Council of Ministers to ensure that European electoral law is advanced so we have a stable foundation for the 2019 elections. We wish you the best of success. We need compromise. We need to work together and the EPP stands ready. Thank you. Mrs. Rodriguez has the floor on behalf of the Socialist and Democrat Group in the European Parliament. Welcome, dear Prime Minister, and welcome to the Maltese Presidency. You are starting your presidency in a very challenging context. Europe being surrounded by many sources of tension and between the Putin effect on one hand and the Trump effect on the other hand. So calls for nationalistic solutions. But we Europeans, we really believe in united solutions, cooperative solutions, and European unity is more important than ever. European unity, European solidarity, as you just referred to. That's why this should be translated into an ambitious roadmap to be adopted in Rome in the uh, 5th uh, of March, 25th of March, uh, because we need once and for all to assert the European Union as a strong economic, social, political and democratic power. We need to use the roadmap for this and to reconnect with our citizens with this purpose. So we believe in our group that the roadmap should be an ambitious one, a progressive one, and this means that if we start with the Bratislava roadmap, 
which was pointing out the need of strengthening European defence and security. And we can agree with this, but we say clearly this is not enough. And we need to have a roadmap where social Europe is really at the heart to reconnect with citizens, making the best of the upcoming European pillar of social rights. And we need also to make sure that the growth and job strategy will be underpinned by a more powerful investment plan, aligned with sustainable development goals. And these goals should also inspire our development policy, because this is the only way to go to the source of the migration wave coming. We need to cooperate with third countries, developing countries, to help them to address their development problems. This is the real root of the challenge coming from migration. And then, of course, you just mentioned this, uh, Prime Minister. Another big test for your presidency is to come up with a real European asylum system where we can again restate our values because we cannot go on like that. What is happening with refugees so far remains a shame. And finally, we need to translate this into credible financial instruments, financial means, which means to align the community budget to support all these goals and to make sure that Eurozone member states, they also have the instruments to implement these objectives. So we are waiting for the Commission white paper. We would like to have also a powerful reform and balanced reform of economic and monetary union, and we count on your presidency to support this push. So this, to conclude, a roadmap to prepare Europe for the future, a roadmap to reconnect again with citizens is in your hands. Thank you. Mr. Kamal has the floor now on behalf of the ECR group. Thank you. We stand here today at the start of a new year, at the start of a new presidency of the Council, at the start of a new president of the Parliament. And the ECR group wishes of both the new presidencies the very best. Let us hope that these presidencies will be the new start that the EU so badly needs, to face up to the challenges, not just of the next six months, but the next few years. Presidencies so often judge their success on how many trialogues are completed or how much new legislation is passed in their six months. But while more trialogue agreements can give the illusion of action, we have to ask with each new agreement whether the people we represent feel safer, whether the people we represent feel more prosperous, whether the people we represent feel more confident in us taking decisions on their behalf. This must be a proud and historic moment in the history of Malta. A Maltese Prime Minister, a former member of the European Parliament, taken over the presidency of the European Union. And you chose as your first priority to bring the EU closer to the people by encouraging vigorous debate on the key issues. But that closeness you desire will not be achieved by legislating every aspect of people's lives or by being preoccupied with the intrigue and the politicking of the Brussels bubble but by listening and acting on the big issues facing the EU and by doing less, but by doing it better. Taking tough but fair decisions on migration and asylum, cooperating on security, offering protection against those who wish us harm, solving the problems of the Eurozone while facing the challenges and opportunities of Brexit. For while the process of Britain leaving the, United Ke leaving the EU will begin on your watch. Let us hope that this presidency sees Brexit about more than just the intricacies of Article 50, but about creating the, uh, uh, the basis for a constructive and mutually beneficial relationship between the UK and the EU, a prosperous U European Union trading and cooperating with a prosperous United Kingdom. Let us hope that in addressing your specific issues of migration, security, single market, social inclusion, the neighbourhood policy and the maritime sector, that the Maltese presidency is able, able to draw a clear distinction between migration and asylum to ensure that the EU delivers a policy that is tough but fair, is able to strengthen security cooperation that makes our peoples feel protected 
and less vulnerable. To develop a single market to deliver less bureaucracy and more choice for consumers. To encourage social inclusion that learns from the very best projects in our local communities in each of our countries. And to develop a neighbourhood policy that does not mean a costly EU army, but the ability to take the tough decisions on sanctions when they really matter. And also to encourage innovation and growth in the maritime sector to support increased open trade. So speaking as leader of what is still the third largest political group in the European Parliament, I urge you to throw away the template of previous presidencies and take the EU in a new direction. And if we can see real progress on your priorities over the next six months, then in years to come, we will all look back at this Maltese presidency as a true turning point in the history of the European Union. Thank you. On behalf of the Aldi Group, Mr. Verhofstadt. Thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, the Prime Minister, uh, thank you for your inspiring uh, uh, intervention. Uh, thank you also uh, for always um, defending the interest of uh, the European Parliament, and that will be necessary, I think, in the coming uh, months. Uh, certainly also because of uh, the negotiations on Brexit. I will not talk about Brexit. We have this afternoon, uh, colleagues, uh, a debate with uh, President Tusk uh, on it. And um, I agree with, uh, it's not always the case with, uh, with uh, my colleague Mr. Kamal, we say it, it could be a true turning point. Yeah, let's face it, the turning point uh, is already there. An American president, Trump, who is openly, in fact, against the European Union and saying that other countries will break away. What turning point we need? Yeah, the, so the only who will, who will find it okay. Uh, why are you still here? I'm asking myself. Go to the United States. Go to the inauguration of Mr. Trump instead of being here. And, but an American president openly saying they're going other countries break away from the European Union, I have never seen it, never heard it. And I think that is a wake-up call for us to reform the European Union the fastest as possible. If we don't understand now that we have stick together, that we need unity, that we need reform, that we need a more integrated European Union, also for our geopolitical interest, when are we going to understand it? It's the moment. And that is, I think, your enormous historical responsibility. You will have this uh, important uh, Valletta in February, a summit where you're going to talk with the other leaders of the European Union about the future. Well, I think uh, it's absolutely necessary. And we in the House, there is a coalition between the PPE and the ALDE, have prepared five concrete points of what, in our opinion, is necessary for this reform of the European Union. Not to, not, not to go away and say, oh, no, no, it's not necessary. We think it's necessary. And we offer also... Uh, a very good method to do so. Why not doing the method we used with uh, the Monte report? The Monte report was a report on the own resources of the European Union, where the three institutions work together, Council, Commission and European Parliament. That is the proposal we make. Start the process and let it be an open process. It's not a process of two groups. It has to be a process, Gianni, of all pro-Europeans in this Parliament. It's not the time to start now the elections in 2019 and to say, oh, I'm in opposition to the rest of the European Parliament. It's time to work together now because it is now that we have to rescue Europe, not in 2019. Thank you. For your information, since we're very behind the scheduled times, I'm not accepting blue cards. If everyone sticks to the times, then we should be able to allow more speaking time during Catch the Eye. So colleagues who wish to speak can uh, sign up to the Catch the Eye, but we're very, very behind schedule. The f floor is now with the uh, GUE group, Mr. Silikiotis. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to seize the opportunity to congratulate you on your election. I'd like to wish you a productive presidency of the European Parliament for the benefit 
and for the upgrading of the Parliament and our citizens. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. President of the Commission, the uh, Maltese Presidency must manage the deep economic crisis. Uh, but to manage that, we should not insist on the destructive neoliberal policies and on the uh, pact and the stability pact. We must uh, uh, adopt measures that will really aid the real economy and the uh, social cohesion. We are for the measures for new uh, jobs and for helping uh, SMEs. But the new targets, these new targets cannot function because they are in the framework of a neoliberal policy, which means more debt, more sovereign debt, more unemployment, more inequalities, and more destitution. The Maltese presidency considers that the refugee crisis is the main priority. This is good. We want to have a common asylum system and to revise the Dublin regulation and more equal distribution of the burden. But that's not enough. We must abolish Dublin. We, sh we should have a refugee policy on the basis of solidarity. Europe should not become a fortress. And uh, this is also true about the unacceptable uh, agreement between the EU and, and Turkey. There should be a just system for distribution of refugees. Otherwise, the refugees will continue drowning in the Mediterranean, and it will be the double responsibility of the Union. Furthermore, within the neighborhood policy, which is a priority, we should stop supporting and any participation in foreign interventions. The European Union should become a pillar for peace. In particular, we should uh, put pressure to Israel to stop the settlements, to stop the occupation, and to adopt a road map for peace and for the two-state solution. And we expect the Maltese presidency, in view of the developments in the Cyprus issue, to undertake initiatives so that the Union might put pressure to bear on Turkey to respect the rights of all Cypriots to stop occupation, withdraw the troops, and to show a constructive attitude for a solution of the Cyprus issue on the basis of bi-zonal, bi-communal federation without uh, troops and barbed wire. And I would like to thank President Juncker for his presence and contribution to the peace conference in Geneva. And I hope that uh, his presence will become even more active because it is very important for all us Cypriots. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Silikiotis. And now, Mr. Lamberts for the Greens EFA Group. Thank you, President. Prime Minister, welcome to the European Parliament. And I would like to uh, wish the Maltese Presidency all our um, uh, best. Uh, Lithuania proved that uh, a small country can be successful, and I'm sure you will do the same. But it's a difficult time between the Turkish, Russian, Chinese and American presidents who are now determined to split Europe and also an extreme right uh, which is determined to go back to the past. Europe uh, is the first experience of a transnational democracy which is currently under threat. One of your priorities was migration and of course that is natural. 2016 was the most deadly in the Mediterranean the reasons behind migration are very far from having disappeared and this year uh, tens of thousands of refugees who've come to the European Union are stuck in camps which are absolutely inhumane. With Italy and Greece, Malta is also in the first line and facing up to these challenges and you could say that solidarity from the other uh, member states was not particularly uh, rapid or broad. And I hope that Malta will do all it can to mobilize this solidarity. The uh, relocation of uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees has not happened. Only about 10,000 have been uh, relocated at the moment. And so we have to accelerate um, this agreement and we have to ensure that uh, this becomes the norm. Malta alone shouldn't be allowed to deal with this problem. But also, uh, within the agreement with Turkey, uh, the idea is to contain and to, to repatriate. Uh, 
but what about agreements with uh, Libya between two uh, governments who are um, uh, clearly uh, um, bellicose? How, uh, why are we agreeing to these types of uh, things? This is not in line with the values of the European Union. The second point that I wanted to raise was uh, tax justice. That's not even on your list of priorities. Tax competition. Um, which absolutely uh, unbridled between member states can only harm the taxpayer and this has to be an absolute priority for us. Without this we're going to see uh, huge inequalities. It's going to lead, uh, it's going to feed into tax evasion and feed into nationalist, the rise of na uh, nationalist and populism. The Council of Commission with support of Parliament has uh, increased its uh, initiatives on this, uh, in this area and I can't see any reference to it in your priorities. Malta is a tax haven for multinationals between 2012 and 2015. Your country took, in, uh, took 14 billion in tax income from other member states. So I would ask you to work as quickly as possible on the negotiations in council on this, particularly the anti-money laundering directive and creating public registers of the uh, real beneficiaries of um, trusts also on public uh, tax declarations for multinationals and starting to uh, harmonize the tax base for um, corporate tax. We know that there are a lot of elections uh, coming up in Europe and that this can lead to um, a state of paralysis. However, I would say use the increasing indignation of our citizens to try to lift some of the blocks that you might find in front of you. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. So now, on behalf of the EFDD group, I give the floor to Mr. Paxas. Mr. Chairman, colleagues, so this is the start of the Maltese presidency. And yet another broad agenda, another attempt to open new pages of the EU policy. How many attempts like this have there been? Today, the windows of EU institutions are brightly lit. But I would say that this light remains in between these walls. It does not reach many people. Millions of Europeans are simply striving to survive in the shadows of their complicated da daily life in social exclusion, permanent unemployment, and in the context of emigration and other threats that are constantly escalated by the media. The EU is still undergoing a deep crisis of identity, which, is, which has been deepening year after year. And this, in my view, is the main problem of our community, which negatively affects the trust of citizens in the current EU policy. Our legislative activities are intensive and productive. However, the mechanisms of essential political decisions do not work. The reason for this might be that Brussels is increasingly ignoring national parliaments and is striving to become a true central power. However, I hope that Malta during its presidency will formulate new priorities of the EU and will manage to persuade us that it is possible to implement them. Thank you. Grazie. Ora per Thank you. On behalf of the EMF group, Mr. de Graaf. Voorzitter, meneer Muscat. President, I'm very happy that the Maltese presidency considers migration the main priority for Europe and is in favor of more monitoring of the external borders. But we know what that means what that's meant so far, more efforts to pick up migrants off the coast of Libya and more people being sent across to Europe. We know that when we increase the monitoring of external borders, we end up getting more migrants being delivered into the moors of hell. Every major day we have a major Islamist um, attack and we have problems with financial and medical assistance and with asylum. 
this mass migration is leading to the collapse of Europe. The only thing we can do is to have national borders again so that we can quickly repatriate illegal migrants and uh, restore Europe. Thank you, Mr. de Graaf. Uh, Mrs. Morvay. Thank you, President. A new uh, time is uh, being ushered in. Congratulations to Mr. Tajani, who has been uh, re-elected. It's a day of celebration for you today. It's uh, impressive to see how your heart returns to your home country, Italy, when you talk about the solidarity to be shown to earthquake victims. Just yesterday you were elected president, but yesterday also had a, another winner too, Mrs. Helga Stevens, who also stood as a candidate, and in her speech she said a few words that I would like to commend to the Maltese Presidency when she said it is possible to be born deaf but I am gifted in listening to people's voices. I commend that to you. You should encourage and teach European politicians to listen to the voices of European citizens in areas such as migration. You should listen to the real stories of real people, the indigenous peoples, and hear about how their lives have been stood upside down by massive immigration. This affects women, above all, who now are possible victims. Uh, that's how they live their lives, fearing criminal attacks. Listen to their stories, and their stories should be incorporated into your migration policy. You should also listen to the voices of the new member states. You are, after all, from a new member state yourself. The Hungarian citizens have uh, had it up to here. They've been a member of the EU for 10 years, and the pay differentials are now tenfold if you compare Austria and Hungary. So it's about social inclusion. The EU should accept post-communist states as member states with equal rights. All member states should have equal dignity. The citizens of Hungary should enjoy the same level of respect. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kaza. Thank you, Mr. President. I am conflicted by this presidency. I worked hard for Malta to accede to the European Union. Seeing my country at the helm of the EU should be a moment of great pride. But I am embarrassed by this government. This administration is based on vindictiveness. It is shameless and riddled with corruption. This administration hindered local press from being present at ministerial presidency briefings. The closest associates of this prime minister were caught red-handed. The Panama Papers revealed they opened offshore money laundering structures within which they planned to deposit millions of euros. The leading figure amongst them is Minister Konrad Mitzi, who will now be chairing the EU Council Energy Meetings. Yesterday, it was also revealed that Konrad Mitzi's Panama company is still active. This minister embodies all that the EU is against. Corruption is the antithesis of European values. The situation is surreal, and I will not stand before you and give a speech as though all is normal. I cannot and I will not. I am proud to be Maltese and of what we have very successfully achieved, but I am ashamed of this administration. Its greed and disregard for basic decency does not represent us Maltese and Godetans. Thank you. Honorable Sant. 
Mr. Sand. Among the objectives that the Maltese presidency has set, that of giving importance to the EU's Mediterranean dimension should be welcomed by all. The Mediterranean has recently been relegated mostly to references where it features as a theater for immigration tragedies. Still, it remains a neighborhood which the EU shares with states whose medium to long-term interests will eventually converge with those of the Union. These interests cover economic, political, social, cultural and security matters. Promoting an ongoing cohesive approach towards cooperation in such areas should again be given full priority by the EU. In doing so, it is crucial not to give the impression that Europe is pursuing an agenda of regime change or that it is trying to revive the exploitative scenarios of the past. It is true that cooperation would best develop between all sides of the Mediterranean if our institutions converged, as we all would like, towards democracy. But these developments must come about through the action and initiative freely taken by all the peoples concerned. If, however, these developments do not take place or if they happen differently to the way Europe has developed, then still it remains in all our interests to ensure that Europe's Mediterranean policy is proactive and forward-looking. It would be a gross mistake for Europeans to cherry-pick the topics they would like to work on based on their own agendas. On the other hand, Europe needs to show that when it comes to security issues and terrorism, it cannot but be hard and ready to strike against terrorists of all stripes and against those who aid and encourage them. All this amounts to a complex program, yet it can be misunderstood politically and morally. And that would be a real pity. Malta has a vested interest to see to it that all sides of the Middle Sea prosper and develop as they face up to the specific challenges. It has the advantage of not being in a position to have any hidden agenda. Its good faith cannot be disputed, and this should make the Maltese government's proposal to give salience to Mediterranean affairs a very valuable starting point. Even if the Maltese presidency only partly succeeds in achieving its objective to do so, the effort will have been well worthwhile. La parola non arrive Lucche. Mr. Lucke. Herr Präsident, uh, Herr Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, Europe needs new reforms and I think it is your main task in the course of uh, your terms of office to bring this forward. There are a lot of people in uh, this House who agree that reform is necessary, even people who usually don't agree. Um, I saw Mr. Verhofstadt talking about this. Europe continues to, to be a big problem. The economy is a big problem, and the state debt is part of that. Now, there's something that you didn't mention, and that is that we should have some kind of a system for state bankruptcy in the Eurozone. We know from the IMF that there's no way around state bankruptcies in the Eurozone. This is because the European Union is not able to implement the rigidity in budgetary terms that is required by the treaty. So we should have some kind of system for insolvencies. Thank you. Mrs. Desane. Thank you, President. The European Union has uh, weaknesses and we're seeing a recurring uh, lack of political will from national governments and so this means that we're facing increasing challenges, uh, crisis in the economy and employment, uh, migrants, uh, terrorism, wars at our borders and the um, departure of the United Kingdom. And at the same time we're seeing the Russian and uh, United States governments also uh, trying to claim their share with all of the um, risks inherent in that. And so for Europe and Europeans, it's necessary to act. Europe has to finally decide that it will exist. Um, now is time to move forward in uh, refounding our union, to have a sustainable growth 
on the table and to ensure that within the Eurozone we have tax and social harmonisation and that we have political governance, uh, the political governance that we've been waiting for a long time now. Now is the time to speak with one voice and finally ensure that we see the end of the crises in Syria and Iraq and uh, uh, make its voice heard in global diplomacy to also uh, build a real security and defence policy in Europe. And now, as you said, uh, Prime Minister, is the time to implement a common policy worthy of the name when it comes to asylum, migration and development. European citizens expect that their leaders should finally uh, be up to these challenges. It's our duty to act and to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sakharova. Dear colleagues, I am satisfied as a rapporteur that the Maltese Presidency has uh, uh, said that concerning research and technology, the uh, European partnership uh, is an important priority. There are nine member states and a 200 million budget uh, uh, within the 2020 framework. There is a 10-year period for implementing it. We want to have more security and more accessibility to uh, food systems and also better management of water in the Mediterranean. There are conflicts, there is climate change and political instability and over-exploitation of resources and also more population. These are the problems that have to do with migration. The money, sorry, uh, the money, yes, is one of the possibilities we have to try to face the problems of uh, migration in the Mediterranean. So I look forward to the cooperation of uh, all our institutions to try to implement the PRIMA program. Thank you, Mr. Sakorafa, and I now give the floor to Mr. Giegold. Mr. Commissioner, colleagues, uh, this Parliament has made the fight against tax evasion and money laundering a priority. Malta unfortunately exploits a loophole in corporation tax policy of the EU. It treats local income differently than international income. Local businesses have to pay 35% on their profits. International corporations profit from a, as low as 5% corporation tax rate. That is not social. That is not European. Prime Minister, I call on you change that in the interest of the coherence of the common market. And second, members of the Maltese government appear in the Panama Papers. Will you cooperate fully with our inquiry committee and publish the investigative report of Ma Manfred Galdes on the inclusion of some members of your government or close to your government in the Panama Papers uh, information? So please cooperate fully with our investigation here in the Parliament. Thank you. Honorable von Stork. Mrs. von Stork. Prime Minister, President, President of the Commission, we uh, are talking about the programme of the new Maltese Presidency, and I note a change. The Maltese Presidency on illegal migration has declared a high priority. The previous Presidency, Slovakia, talked about sustainable migration. And before that, the Netherlands talked about current migration with a comprehensive approach to be taken against it. And before that, the Luxembourg, naive as they were, talked about an effective immigration policy that they wanted to manage better. So within two years, what used to be effective uh, immigration, which was to be better managed, we have now focused on illegal immigration and I think we're getting to the nub of the matter now because illegal immigration is the cause of the problem and it doesn't need to be better managed but prevented and brought to an end. I'd be happy to believe that the Maltese Presidency will do this uh, but seeing is believing. Thank you, President. Before I get Thank you Mr. President. Before I start talking about the Maltese Presidency 
and the summit in Valletta. Can I just say something about the current situation? The circus and the fight for influence and power has just about finished, but we still have to elect 14 vice presidents. And I wonder why do we need 14 vice presidents? That's not an idea of slim management. I accept it, of course, but can I just appeal to you? Mr. President, to work equivocally with all the groups, unlike Mr. Schultz, who saw everything through party political spectacles. Now, on to the Maltese presidents. You try to put a stop to illegal migration. That's all fine and good, but the real idea would be to keep people in their home regions, take the money that we're now spending on keeping people out and spend it there, rather than having a sort of magnet drawing people into Europe. That's what we need to do. Uh, we need to take measures to have jobs. There are a lot of conferences about LGBT, but there are no conferences on creating real jobs which would mean a good future for Europe. Thank you. La parola Mr. Gornish. The Maltese presidency's priorities are barely different from the priorities of their predecessors and is very much in line with the uh, three presidencies' work. I would like to use this opportunity to respond to Mr. Juncker, to Mr. Weber, Mr. Lambert, Mr. Verhofstadt, and they think that they can uh, criticize uh, extremist, populist, nationalist, as if we're trying to just to break your toys just because we're not very nice. But that's not true. What we see is most of the uh, paralyzing regulations here mean that the European Union is unable to face up to the challenges facing our countries, whether it's the ongoing social and economic challenges, the migration challenges, instability, terrorism, and of course we very much um, regret this situation. In its history, Malta was uh, an outpost protecting Europe from uh, Islam, and I hope uh, it will continue to be so today. Honorable Proust. Mr. Proust. President, Prime Minister, on the 1st of January, Malta assumed the presidency of the Council at a time when the issues facing our continent have never been starker. On behalf of the French delegation in the EPP group, I am very happy indeed to see the top priority of the Maltese presidency being managing the refugee crisis. Urgent need is required to assuage the legitimate concerns of the majority of EU citizens. In 2016, we fought in Parliament to ensure that the PNR, the passenger name record, was adopted. And we also fought to ensure that a Coast Guard and a Border Guard agency would play a greater role in security and stability. And therefore, we need to be realistic. By achieving results, we will cope with the streams uh, who benefit from instability. On the 60th anniversary of the uh, Treaty of Rome, uh, we will see an official start to the Brexit negotiations. We need to stand firm. An a la carte Europe cannot uh, come to pass. I think uh, the gloomy prospects faced by the country leaving the Union are now becoming clear to the British. We need a heightened control of borders. We need uh, more cooperation on security in the continent. Uh, we need to commit to a strong economy through investments and defending our interests in trade agreements or fighting tax and social dumping. These are the policy files where Europe must act forcefully in the weeks to come. They must stand united and pragmatic, faced with the geopolitical challenges it has to face. Thank you, Mrs. Fayon. Thank you. Prime Minister, you envisage that in spring Europe will be confronted with a new migration wave. You have drawn uh, 
attention to the possibility of a truly serious crisis unless everybody in the EU takes on common responsibility. Take action if this is the case, if this is not the case. Indeed, cooperation with Turkey is of key importance, but it is just as essential to establish safe and legal pathways for refugees escaping to the European soil. This is not done today. Malta has experience with migrants and refugees, and I count on you that we set up an effective European migration policy. I also welcome your initiative for a Valletta summit, for a Valletta summit, but I also hope that you will search for solutions to renovate the, uh, and uh, reform the European Union. We are standing still, if I sum up the past year. You are placing the individual um, citizen at the center and you are using the so-called pragmatic idealism. In this way, you want to address their concerns, create more jobs, and ensure security. I really hope that together we make it. I come from Slovenia, which is also a small country, and I believe that Malta has all the opportunities to chair the European Union in fair and consistent manner. Thank you, Mrs. Hazard. Voorzitter, uit de laatste Eurobarometer blijkt... President. The latest Eurobarometer shows the majority of the Maltese population want to improve European animal welfare legislation. I would urge the Maltese Presidency to work for new European animal welfare legislation, less intensive stock farming, more protection for pets. But how credible would that be when Malta itself is a bloody battlefield for birds? Millions of migrating birds use Malta as a staging post, but they get little rest. Right now, the autumn hunt, which targets dozens of bird species, is ongoing. And in the spring, some 10,000 hunters will shoot thousands of uh, European turtle doves and quail in barely three weeks. Many of the birds are illegally killed by hunters, Montague's harriers, swifts, and golden orioles, to mention but a few. This is unacceptable and is contrary to all international agreements. You can choose. Malta can be a beautiful Mediterranean bird paradise, or it could be an island of murders uh, run by hunters. And by the way, I think that European farm subsidies should be abolished. Honorable Castaldo. Mr. Castaldo. Grazie, President. Thank you, President. I have to say that initially I was struck positively by your speech, Prime Minister, but then I wonder whether I heard you properly. Is the Turkey agreement a model for you which is illegal in that it has no legal basis, uh, nothing adopted by this Parliament, and it's just uh, an act of convenience, and it's almost uh, like a semi-treaty uh, that's been rushed through? and uh, civil society, the media and the rest of parliament are left in the lurch and there are threats. A number of countries have uh, put their electoral interests uh, above the rest of the union and who then do we work with? Uh, uh, Egypt which is doing nothing about the uh, murder of Giulio Reggiani a year ago uh, or other countries that are in chaos and that have taken illegal uh, decisions uh, bereft of any m moral underpinnings. They need to be made to face up to their responsibilities. On the southern shore of the Union, there are countries far off from our values. Th there's just Tunisia. Malta is a small country. Uh, its results will be great if it uh, is really uh, committed, gets stuck in, and avoids the hypocrisy of recent years. Mrs. Atkinson. Prime Minister, um, when I attended the Conference of Presidents last month in, in Malta, you and your cabinet were at great pains to stress your offshore, offshore tax status is firmly off the agenda for your presidency. You haven't mentioned it today, how very odd. Um, I was the only one in that meeting to, to, to tell you honestly that it will be firmly on the agenda in this place. Higher taxes mean raiding our pockets to pay for their fouled vanity projects. Higher tax on electricity, CO2, the financial tax, transaction tax and a one size that won't fit all corporation tax is on the 2017 agenda. They hate the fact that you've established an offshore tax haven and good for you and I wish that Britain would actually follow suit. They hate the fact 
that you've done that. Um, and that's music to my ears. And as Britain sets off an exciting Brexit future with Donald Trump in the White House and my, my colleagues here riding high in the polls, I'm actually quite optimistic, one of the very few that are optimistic about 2017. They may not get round to your tax status as they're too busy destroying our country's identities with mass migration, putting our security at risk and their obsession with the green blob and the gender issues. That should keep them pretty busy, turning a blind eye to your tax status. On Brexit, it's in the EU's interest, actually, not to have the usual drawn-out uh, free trade negotiations. I wish you well, um, and nice to see you again. Honorio del Castillo. Uh, Mrs. Del Castillo. Thank you, President, and welcome to the Maltese Presidency. You've already emphasized the main points of the Presidency's priorities uh, migration, security, the social aspect. Uh, the social implications of uh, EU policies, Brexit, etc. We all know that only a healthy economy will allow us to face up to all of these issues which uh, I've just laid out and which are priorities for the Maltese Presidency uh, uh, in an effective way. That's why we have to really emphasize this point. It's absolutely fundamental that the European economy can compete globally and that it can create jobs and that it can generate economic resources which will allow states and governments to develop their social policies. So given this backdrop, there is something that is in your hands in this presidency. And that is working on legislation on the single digital market and uh, following through with that legislation because uh, the digital single market is going to be a great driver for the European economy and ensuring that our economy can compete globally and uh, will therefore be a healthy economy, one which can guarantee the proper development of all of your priorities and will allow us to tackle the social dimension. Uh, issues such as connectivity and infrastructure. In this presidency, you have a real opportunity to reach a common position which will allow us to get the political agreement uh, further down the line. So this is really fundamental and I really want to emphasize this point on behalf of this parliament uh, to ensure that this happens under your presidency. Uh, Mrs. Mitzi. Grazie, Sir President. Prime Minister was Thank you, President, Prime Minister. The Maltese Presidency will play an important role in breathing new life into Europe by focusing on challenges that affect us all, such as migration, security, Brexit, and others amongst others. It is ironic that when we mark the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome in March, a treaty which calls for greater unity amongst Europeans, we will also witness the United Kingdom triggering Article 50 to leave the Union. These are two events which will occur during the Maltese Presidency and should help step up our efforts to unify the EU. The time has come to present a stronger Europe focused in its efforts and determined to deliver benefits which truly resonate with the people. We have to work towards fulfilling promises made to our citizens, including abolishing roaming charges, the revision of the Dublin regulation and the European asylum system, so that they will really witness and feel the benefits of membership. Although it is the smallest member state, Malta has set itself an ambitious to-do list that reflects the times we live in, and I am certain that these these aims will be achieved in the interest of all European citizens. Thank you. Thank you, President. We've heard over and over again that the biggest challenge for the Maltese presidency is migration or rather the management of this migration. At the same time, I'd like to stress, and it's something we've heard over and again, that it would be a good thing if the Panama Papers could be made public, and if it could be made public, how the investigations are going. I welcome the fact that the Council Presidency is saying that we should stabilize our neighboring countries like Libya 
and uh, that it wants to look at the, the causes of migration. At the same time, we need to guard the external borders effectively. We can't have uncontrolled masses of people flowing into Europe. We really need to distinguish between economic migrants and real refugees who have earned it or who deserve the title of refugees. But we need zones in Europe where potential refugees can gather. I would just like to remind you that we're very behind schedule, so please stick to your speaking time because otherwise we won't have time for uh, catch the eye. At one o'clock we have the President's press conference and then the vote on the uh, Vice President's. So please stick to the time you've been given. Mr. Leinen. Yeah, Mr. President, I remember very well the years we have worked together in this House, years where there was a real optimism about the European idea and a big uh, engagement for the European project. And like others here, I hope very much that your presidency can bring back a new dynamic. Let's say give hope to the citizens about Europe, show them the benefits and communicate the benefits and uh, bring and deliver security in times of many insecurities. But I'm here for a legislative file that is not in the spotlight, but very important for the future of the European Parliament especially uh, the European elections in 2019. And you are the last chance, the Maltese uh, presidency, that this dossier gets really decided. If you miss that opportunity, we will not have the chance to reform the European elections. You know that we work with the Electoral Act from 1976, completely outdated. And I hope that your team, and especially you and your colleagues, can bring that to a positive result the Parliament has uh, done the draft with a large majority, so really take that to your heart. It would benefit uh, the Parliament and future elections. Thank you very much. Mrs. Gabriel. Thank you, President. Prime Minister. I would like to wish you all the very best success uh, for the Maltese Presidency of the Council. Uh, priorities. First of all, m migration. Reform of Dublin is vital. We need to have a solution at European level, a solution which will allow us to share our responsibility equally and which won't put unfair pressure on the countries uh, which have an external border. Then secondly, we need proper cooperation on security. The system for uh, entry and exit is vital if we're going to improve security, uh, the security of our external borders. We also need very clear agreements with partner countries. Then thirdly, uh, foreign policy. Our is linked to the future of our neighbours and we have to continue to work to resolve crises but we can't forget those countries which are, um, uh, uh, which are secure like Jordan or Tunisia. Then I would call upon the Maltese Presidency to liberalise the visa regime for Ukraine. The European Parliament has done its part and now it's up to the Council. Mrs Daly. Grazie, Sir President. Thank you. Congratulations on your new role, Prime Minister. To the contrary to my colleague from EPP, I'm not ashamed to be Maltese. I am very pleased to welcome the uh, Maltese government here in the European Parliament and you, Prime Minister, as a social democratic Prime Minister at the helm of the Council Presidency. Being the smallest member state of the EU has its advantages. Given our proximity to our constituents, we understand the need to address our citizens' everyday reality. Prime Minister, this is our opportunity to work together with you towards making the EU relevant to our people. This is the time to preempt the problems that Europe will be facing, the time for both decisions on migration and security, for instance. Not to act is not an option, and you know this very well. On migration, I share your approach to attack human traffickers whilst making sure that refugees and asylum seekers make it to Europe safely. 
On security, we need to make sure that the EU remains united, a place where countries continue seeing one another as allies and not as security problems. This is our challenge in these critical times, but ultimately it is up to us to deliver a European Union that really matters and makes a difference and puts citizens at the heart of the EU. Thank you, President. Of course, I would like to welcome uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Tajani as President, uh, and if he continues as he started in two and a half years, he will have seen through an exemplary presidency. With regard to Malta, President in Office of Council, let me say clearly that the emphasis on resolving the refugee and migration crisis is a very good idea, and Malta has a great deal to teach all EU member states. Malta, after all, is experiencing this problem in a unique way given its geographic position. Unfortunately, despite the emphasis on security, there's been no discussion of common defence, and I think that's important for the next six months. I'd also like to conclude with a comment for Mrs Daly. It's most regrettable to hear said that uh, Mr. Kaza was doing the wrong thing in what he was saying about Malta. He did the right thing. There's a lot of suspicion about corruption in Malta. So we'll be very careful to see what the Panama Papers tell us and what comes out in terms of corruption in Malta. Saying that Mr. Kaza is unpatriotic is regrettable in a debate like this. Mr. Martin. Thank you, President, and firstly, congratulations on your election, and welcome back to the Prime Minister of Malta. Apart from the many important issues we've already discussed this morning, there is great opportunity under the Maltese Presidency to make progress on international trade issues. I welcome the fact that the Council has reached agreement on trade defence instruments, but it has to be noted that this is quite far from the European Parliament's 2014 position and I hope his government will show flexibility in trying to find a compromise between the institutions. Secondly, uh, there, will be a proposal, there is a proposal addressing China MES and for us this is a crucial file and together with TDI reform they are vital in defending European jobs not just in the steel industry but more widely. So I hope on both TDI and China MES we can work closely and make significant progress. Also during your presidency in the trade area we expect the European Court of Justice to release the EU Singapore FTA, FTA uh, ruling. If the opinion of the Advocate General is confirmed this will mean that it is a mixed agreement. That means actually our trade credibility with our negotiating partners could be threatened and I hope he would call at that point a, summit, a discussion between Parliament, Commission and Council to find a way forward on this issue. Thank you, President. For Catch the Eye, I'm only going to allow four speakers. Um, Svedrova. Vážený pane předsedo, kolegyně a kolegové, myslím, že všichni očekáváme, že prioritou malského předsednictví bude migrace. Váže... Thank you. The priority of the Maltese uh, presidency is to be migration. Prime Minister, you spoke of the need to re-implement the Turkey agreement, which means that we would have to stop illegal trafficking of human beings. You talked about safe corridors for refugees from Africa to Europe, but I must emphasize that the Turkey agreement does not contain such a thing. P President, moving refugees should not be the priority. Stopping the war should be the priority. The reason that people up sticks and come to Europe. Also, we need to pay attention to the Europa and Europa Sport qualification programs, which are vital. Honorable Kinnici. Mrs. Kinnici. Thank you, President. 
Commissioner, uh, Prime Minister, thank you for your presentation on the priorities of the upcoming presidency. This includes uh, migration, and this is one of the most sensitive topics, particularly for countries in the south of Italy, in the south of Europe, for countries like mine, Italy, uh, Greece, and your country. On the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, uh, the focus was placed on a lot, the large number of unaccompanied minors who, as we know, need greater attention and care and protection. So it's up to the EU to accept its responsibilities on migration and to ensure that we have legislative instruments which will be really um, effective to ensure that we can ensure a real solution to this problem. I'm talking particularly about the uh, amendment of the Dublin system. The current proposal does have some positive points, but it doesn't seem uh, quite fitting to provide uh, support for the first-line countries and particularly to protect unaccompanied minors. So we need a more ambitious reform. I rely upon your commitment to this and wish you all the best. Uh, Mr. Marias. Thank you, Chair, and I would like to congratulate you on your election. Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Katain. The situation on our islands in the Aegean is uh, hopeless. There are more than 16,500 refugees and illegal immigrants, while there are only 7,000 seats. This is a cry of anguish of the inhabitants of Hios. On Hios, I was there the last weekend. The feeling of insecurity among the citizens is clear. There are, uh, at this uh, moment, conflicts and uh, uh, attacks against the citizens and conflicts between groups of migrants. The European Union should really fulfill its promises. Where are the hundreds of experts that you had promised us would be sent to the islands? Where are the 6,000 relocations per month from Greece to other EU member states? What measures will you take? to help the 64,000 refugees stranded in Greece now. The Greeks cannot accept the situation anymore. Thank you. Honorary Adi Georgiou. Mr. Haji Giorgio. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to congratulate you on your election to the presidency of the Parliament. I'd like to congratulate the Maltese presidency as well on taking up its duties. I'd like to tell them that they are a small state, but other small states had the presidency and they contributed very substantially in demonstrating that small states can manage. And furthermore, I'd like to agree with Mr. Marias concerning the situation on the Greek islands. It is an unacceptable situation. The Maltese presidency should work to try to help each other. There should be a fair distribution of refugees in all member states. Some member states should not continue to avoid their share of the burden. Finally, it has been said that Malta is considered a tax haven and this has meant that 14 billion of tax receipts have been lost. Nobody is uh, for tax havens. But what can Malta do? Is it going to open mines and uh, car factories? It can only have activity on this uh, sector of the economy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I can't allow any other speakers. Uh, perhaps we can take them on another occasion, but uh, we don't have any more time. Now on behalf of the Commission, Vice President Katainen. President Tajani, let me first congratulate you for your elections. Prime Minister, dear Joseph, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister, Ambassador, Honorable Members, I can be very short. Um, it's uh, easy to say that your presidency have got, uh, has got a strong support from, from uh, the members of the Parliament. Also, as our President Juncker said, you have a strong ally in the European Commission. We do appreciate, like President Juncker said, your strong emphasis on a social agenda, especially when you want to review our previous proposals on various fields, just, uh, such as uh, participation of women in the labour market, uh, priorities or the, uh, prioritise uh, the, the pillar on social rights, the posting of workers, 
the coordination of social security systems, and also when you have decided to, to have a ministerial meeting uh, on the sub subject of uh, sexual minorities. So it's very important for the EU as a whole, and it's very important for our citizens to see that the presidency is prioritizing social agenda uh, so high. Another issue I would like to raise, which was referred here to by many members, is the security agenda. Security and migration issues, but also uh, I want to thank you for our last visit to, to Malta, to Valletta, when we had a chance to discuss about the, the defense agenda. I know that Malta may have some constitutional um, uh, issues with the defense policy as such, but uh, I had a chance to discuss with the finance minister and with the economy minister on defense investments. And this is something which uh, I, I think everybody can share. There is a strong need for stronger European defence policies, but also a strong need for defence co cooperation in defence investments in order to save money at the same time when making our continent more uh, responsive, more secure, more strong uh, and, and capable to address the, the uh, challenges or threats coming outside from, from Europe. Also, I want to thank you for prioritizing internal market issues, single market related issues, because they, those are uh, European level structural reforms, which will reshape Europe, which will strengthen our capability to modernize our economy. Internal market is a way to create new jobs, but also it creates more competition and gives more opportunities for consumers and for, uh, for our companies. So that's why it, we do appreciate your strong support uh, to the work of Commission in this field. In, uh, I, I just want to mention that we just disclosed our services package, services internal market, and, and this is one part of um, the entire internal market agenda. You have also emphasized your willingness to, to, to work with the European Parliament uh, on EFSI FC2 proposal. Let's hope the Parliament can finalize the internal processes as soon as possible and then the, the trials could start during your presidency and even uh, uh, it, it would be even possible to have a final conclusion approval uh, of the co-legislation uh, leaders during your presidency. And finally, I want to thank you for your support on CETA agreement. Trade policy, even though there are uh, growing opposition towards the trade, but it's the way to govern globalization. Uh, free trade doesn't mean trade without rules. Actually, free trade means uh, trade with rules, which uh, enables uh, trading partners to have uh, easier trading environment and this is the way we can govern uh, globalization and make it more socially responsible and environmentally responsible too. So thank you very much for your excellent job and, and this is a good start for your for presidency. Grazie. Thank you Vice President Katainen. Now on behalf of the Council, Prime Minister Mr Muscat. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I found today's exchange to be as colorful as, this, uh, as the way I remembered this, this plenary. I'll start off and I'll try to touch on most, if not all, of the issues that have been raised by my friends. First of all, I, I would like to thank the leaders of the different groups for their extremely positive um, welcome and the extremely positive words they had for this presidency. I'll, I'll start off on migration once again. I know this is an extremely thorny issue not only at European level but in each and every one of our member states. It is an extremely emotional issue. It stirs up all the wrong sentiments maybe and this is where um, the battlegrounds for the next elections in our member states and elsewhere will be, will be played for the next generation at least. So whatever we do today has a short-term impact on the composition of the different institutions, of the different governments in our member states, and it cannot be underestimated. But if we wait for a total solution, for a solution that is perfect, that for a solution where 
we can find no shortcomings. We are condemned to go round in circles and stay in the same rut. My point today was and still is that we may have ideological differences. Actually, we might have moral differences on the way we approach this, this issue. Some of us see it maybe more as a humanitarian crisis. Others see it as a security issue. Maybe we're both right. My point is beyond that. That's the ideological discourse. That's the long term. In the long term, we're all dead. Short term, in three months' time, we will have another crisis. Now, I'm the first to hope that I am extremely wrong on this. I'm the first one to hope that come next spring, it will be business as usual, maybe a few crossings that one member state, two member states, three, maximum four member states can um, really take in. But I'm afraid I will not be wrong. And the situation is, we either take a decision now, or we will have to take a much bolder decision when there is a crisis, when there are, yes, hundreds of thousands of people putting pressures on governments, on communities, on our families, and we would need to take decisions that are maybe not well thought. This is really the last train we need or we have to, or we can catch to do something which is structured when it comes to the collective handling of the migration crisis. Money alone will not do it. So simply thinking that migration and the, 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 the impending crisis and the fact that even if we do something now, um, this is not a long-term solution. But thinking that this can be solved by throwing more money at the problem is delusional. This is not about it. This is about border control. This is about having a new system to share the burden. This is about creating humanitarian corridors where and when necessary. And this is about acknowledging the fact that if we even throw away the concept that has been used by some member state of building walls, which I personally disagree with, but I will not judge that member state for doing that. I will just say, as a country with a maritime border, we cannot build a wall in the sea. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to break it to you, but when my Navy people call me at night, they don't tell me, can we turn the people back or not? They just tell me, we need to save the people from drowning. If we allow this to happen again, not hitting these criminal gangs where it hurts, not engaging with the countries on the su southern littoral of the Mediterranean, we're in for more trouble. We are inviting more trouble as in trying to postpone the issue until there is a perfect solution. There will be no perfect solution for Dublin. There will be no perfect solution for border control. There can only be progress if we really accept one another's view. I need to accept people's view where I might have some ideological differences, but we need operational operational at this point in time, solutions that have been missing so far. And our aim as Maltese Presidency is to try to, to achieve progress on, on this. I think that we were mostly on the same page on, on Brexit. On, on taxation, I, I would beg my colleagues that, uh, and I would tell them I refute totally the label of tax haven or offshore for my country. Our country's tax system has been approved by the European Commission after being thoroughly examined before membership more than a decade ago. So I don't see why things that were approved pre-membership are now a problem today. Um, I have all the respect for my colleague, Mr. Kaza. I understand his, um, his intervention. There is local politics. I think we should not take it here but uh, we will have uh, all the uh, time in the world to have a healthy 
political fight back at home. Um, back here, I will want to stress one final point on the issue of the social agenda, the social pillar by the Commission, and the issue of free trade. I don't see this as contradictory um, aims. I actually see these as complementary aims. It is through free trade that we can create more growth and more jobs. And usually I felt a bit out of tune with my social democratic family in being a very clear advocate of free trade. But seeing that even the president of China is an advocate of free trade, I feel a little bit more at ease in saying free trade is good if it is properly, pro, uh, properly regulated. I do think that the main issue where we should contend right now is not trying to be protectionist. Social Europe does not mean protectionist Europe, does not mean withdrawing from the world, does not mean trying to put up barriers to what we have achieved so far. Social Europe is, means that the growth and the, the, the well-being that we create through free trade needs to be distributed in an equal or at least in, in a fair manner rather than an equal manner. And this was what was missing for um, uh, many years in our member states that all um, the well-being that was created through the policies that were advocated even by these institutions did not percolate through the system and that the belief in just a trickle-down economic approach, well, we have to admit it, it did not work. So will we find a solution to all this during the next six months? Obviously not. What we want is to set the ball rolling in the right direction, build on the good work that has been done by our predecessors. One final point to Parliament. Um, rest assured that the political presence of Council within Parliament will be assured as much as possible because we want a genuine dialogue with yourselves. Thank you, Mr. President. Grazie. Thank you. The debate is now closed and we will suspend for five minutes, resuming again at uh, half past one when we will proceed to the second ballot of the election of Vice Presidents.